Can we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Father, again we come in the precious name of Jesus, asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you saw me smiling upon the platform, it's because of the songs that were chosen. I'm sure the music committee didn't know what I was going to preach about. Matter of fact, nobody did, not even my wife. So from the songs, what do you think I'm going to preach about? Calvary and the cross. <laughs> one song, after, even, even Kathy's songs fit so beautifully. Uh, one part in it said something, I'll carry the cross until my pride is dead. Is that what it said? Well, the, you, you got enough right there. If you want a message, you just hang on to that. You got a message that will help, help you. I'll carry the cross until my pride is dead. I hope you got that. Because you're going to carry one whether you want to or not. Uh, I want to read a couple of verses. First of all, Mar St. Mark's Gospel, the 15th chapter, and starting with verse 19. And then I want to read also a couple of verses in Matthew 16, 24, you're familiar with. St. Mark's Gospel, 15, starting with 19. And they smote him, that is Jesus, on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, and took off the purple from him, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place of Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. May the Lord add his blessing the reading of his precious word. Also in Matthew, the 16th chapter, that you're familiar with this verse so much. Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's something that we each have something within us that's worth more than the whole world, all the golden Fort Knox. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. Tonight I want us to take a new look at Calvary, or at the cross. Simon was on his way to worship and got a cross put on him. Now the two crosses here, if you notice, Simon's put on him, and he, he, uh, he had no choice in the matter. This cross was placed on him by somebody else. But there is a cross which you can choose. The cross that Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him take up his cross. You're going to have to choose that one. But if you don't choose that one, you're going to find one put on you by somebody else anyhow. So whether you like it tonight, you're going to learn something about the cross. Now you can turn your back on it if you want to, but uh, you're going to find out about the cross. Now so Simon didn't choose his cross. Now, and I want you to notice that both crosses lead to Calvary. If somebody places on a cross on you, I want you to know that that cross will lead you to Calvary. And if you choose a cross, that cross will lead you to Calvary. All crosses lead to Calvary, and that is death to self, uh, to a new relationship with Jesus. The cross is the center of the Christian religion, not the birth of Jesus. Isn't it interesting why you think, well, why didn't God let the whole world know Jesus was born? That wasn't important, but he did let the whole world know that Jesus was crucified. That was important, and that he let the world know about. No other religion leads to a cross. All other religions lead to self-exaltation. 
All other religions offer a ladder to climb up to heaven. The cross was such a cruel death that the Romans wouldn't even allow, it was against the law to put any Roman to death by crucifixion. It was so terrible. And yet here in that day of Jesus, these people cried, not only, why didn't they say, well, put him to death? They said, crucify him, the most terrible death that there possibly can be. And the Romans, it was so terrible, they wouldn't crucify any of their own people. Well, what do we learn from the cross? Well, we, of course, we know we learn about God's great love for mankind, that he died for us, which is marvelous. But we also learn how evil the human heart is. If you want a picture of the human heart, go to Calvary. I marvel as I read that story that it was the good people who crucified Jesus and the bad ones who said he was innocent. Come on now. It was the good people who cried because they were the ones that self was the most predominant in these good ones, their position, their place, and they, they were so jealous. Well, even Pilate knew he said they've delivered him for envy, and it was because of this, these good people that was in the hearts of good people, they cried, crucify this man, and the evil people said, I don't find any fault with him. Pilate said, I, uh, this man is innocent. I find no fault in him. Herod said, I find nothing in him that's worthy of death. The Roman soldier said, this is the son of God. So it was the good people, religious people, and the evil world declared him innocent. But the religious people said he's worthy of death. Does that give you a picture of the human heart? The Bible says the heart's desperately wicked. Who can know it? So, as they put him to death, as they crucified him, the heart is desperately wicked. It is at Calvary that we learn who Jesus really is and we learn about ourselves. If you want to know what your heart is like, you go to Calvary. Calvary leads to the death of self. I never heard that song before that Kathy sang, but it certainly is true. It leads to Calvary, and it leads to eternal life. Now, life is full of crosses. You can't evade the cross, you can't avoid it. You may not like to hear it preached about, but you're going to face it one way or another. Somewhere in life, if nothing else, somebody's going to put a cross on you that you don't like. So, life is full of crosses. Calvary is Mount Moriah, and that's where Abraham offered up Isaac. And I want to turn back and read that account just a little bit. In Genesis, the 22nd chapter, I think it is, when the, uh, if I can get the, I think it's the 22nd chapter. Yes, the 22nd chapter. And starting here, Abraham, you remember God said to Abraham, it came to pass that after these days that God, the 22nd chapter, that God did tempt or let us to try Abraham. And said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. He said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham arose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place which God told him. I marvel at that. On the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto the young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Brother, what a worship service. I like something Dr. Tozer said, there's no jiggy-jiggy song singing here. There's seriousness. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. What a worship service and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went, both of them together. 
And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for, the, for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him upon the altar upon the wood. Now Isaac was a young man here, I mean, at least in his teens. He's not a baby. He was carrying the wood. And uh, so it's quite evident that there came a time when Abraham had to sit down with his son and explain what he was going to do. Now some of you may, some may think, well, that was so terrible, he'd offer to sacrifice the son. But there was, that was a custom in those days. And God wasn't asking Abraham to do anything that kings and others weren't doing. So he was only asking Abraham to have the same dedication that a heathen king would have. These heathen kings offer the son, I want you to offer yours. So it wasn't as bad to them as it would be to us. It was really a sacrifice to God. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast withheld, not withheld thine son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, the lamb caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered a burnt offering unto the Lord instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Nissi, as he said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And then God goes on to say to Abraham, because you have obeyed my voice, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Oh, what will happen if God can get us to really obey God completely? All the nations of the world will be blessed. I trust I can see something here. Uh, when Abraham went up that hill, I know the Bible tells in Hebrews that he had faith to know that uh, God's promise was in Isaac and that God would raise him. He knew that. But he thought he was going to have to go through with, with the killing. And that would be a terrible ordeal. Even if God raised him from the dead to have to go through, the ordeal would be terrible. To think that he had to slay his own son, and so I'm sure that going up that hill, you had two people who were pretty sorrowful. It, was, it would be called the hill of sorrow. The same as the road Jesus traveled on the Via Della Rosa, and his little sister called in one of the places we stopped on one of the Israel trips. She said this was the road of sorrow. She said, or was it the road of joy? Well, anyhow, this is the hill of sorrow. I tell you, I'm sure that Abraham was sorrowful even though he had faith to believe that God would raise him up. He still thought he had to endure the, this terrible tragedy of slaying his son. So he went up the hill and when he completely obeyed God, God stopped him and said, Now, wait a minute, Abraham, you don't have to do that. And when they offered the sacrifice of the ram and started down the hill, I want you to know it was the hill of joy. Come on, don't you see something? Every cross that a man faces, it may be crucifixion, but brother, if he'll go through with it, he'll find that it was it's the road of joy. We shun away from it, we shy away from it because we see the hill of sorrow, but if God can get you to the top of it, you'll find it's the hill of joy. What a great God we serve. Jesus had said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The joy came afterwards. The Via Della Rosa was the sorrow after. Moriah was the hill of sorrow, and Abraham's faith kept him in all of this, as, as I said. But this was still a sorrowful journey. Abraham, a man of great faith in God, but yet he carried this cross. 
George Watson said, our real sacrifice, our real Isaac. We talk about, well, we've got to lay something on the altar. Lay your all Isaac. What is your Isaac? Lay your all Isaac on the altar. Everybody, maybe it's your son, your daughter, your money, something. Lay it on the altar. But George Watson said the real Isaac is self. Come on now. Stick with me. And we're willing to give up almost everything but that. People will give up money. They'll give up time, talents, even their own children. But ah, uh, when we come to giving up self and die there, that's where we get into trouble. So the hardest thing in the world is to die to self. When God can get that, then he can do anything with us. But not until. So Calvary leads to the place where the burden of the cross is lifted. Calvary is turning, the turning point in man's life. It's the beginning of a new life. A new life. I like what I said one time. I was in an Anderson camp meeting, and uh, I went back to pray with the people in the prayer room. They have a prayer room there, camp meeting, big tabernacle, and they have a prayer room. And I went back there to pray with some people, if I remember correctly. And I saw a woman outside, and I talked with her, and I said, what are you doing? She said, my husband is in there getting saved. She said, I am out here, I'm waiting for my new husband. <laughs> I like that. She said, I'm waiting for my new husband. Salvation ought to do that. Ought to, as the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things can become new. Dear ones, can we allow our cross, can it take us to Calvary where we can die to self so that God can bless the world? And then coming down, we can come down the hill of joy. Every man who has ever died to himself has been a man that's been a joyful spirit. You show me a man that's a joyful Christian, and I'll show you a man who died to self somewhere along the line. What a privilege, this man coming down the hill of sorrow, it turned out to be the hill of joy. So the thing we don't like is the thing really that's the most blessed thing in all the world, Calvary. Jesus, who died to save us, but he wants us to carry our cross to Calvary.